Good morning. Welcome to this month's special edition of the Center for Food Integrity's Illuminate Digital Cultural Insights Report. Today, we're lucky to be co-hosting this event with FMI, the Food Industry Association. And with us, we have Steve Markinson, FMI's Director of Research and Insights, as we discuss the effect of inflation on consumer decision-making this holiday season. I know we barely have our costumes for Halloween created yet, but this year more than ever, we're seeing consumers planning their holiday shopping early. And as always for Motive Base, we have Cheryl Auger, Director of Client Success, who will be sharing out the research conducted on this topic. I'm Mickey French, Executive Director of the Center for Food Integrity, the organization dedicated to building trust across the food system. So we're happy to have everyone with us this morning. We have a good and robust bust group. Um, as a reminder, please feel free to put any questions along the way into the chat or the Q&A section, and hopefully we'll have time at the end to get to those. So, Steve and Cheryl, over to you. Great. Thanks so much. This is a, a, a very topical topic today, in fact. I'll go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. For those of you who are familiar with our webinar, you may have heard about Motive Base previously. But for those of you who are new to the motive-based approach, I'll give you a very quick overview of who we are and how we do research, and then we'll dive into our findings. So we are a team of cultural anthropologists. Um, we are obsessed with the study of meaning. Meanings change over time. Some meanings increase in prevalence, others decrease in prevalence. And this all has implications for our, our business and business questions. So we take an anthropological approach. As I said, we're a team of anthropologists, so it makes sense. But what we do is we do observational ethnography um, and we are studying meaning. We have an AI tool. So we are able to look at a large number of people in a short period of time. Um, our AI tool allows us to collect up to 20 million data points month over month. Um, you know, where, where we're looking at conversations that consumers are having in any case. We have two criteria for our data collection. One is that consumers can be anonymous or use a pseudonym. That is, they're not so worried about identity management or, you know, maybe my boss is gonna hear this so they can say what they're really thinking. The second criteria is that they're engaged in long form text-based conversation. And that's because we use natural language processing to help us decode meaning, to help us understand not just what's going on for consumers, but why things even matter to them, or what's, what's the deeper thing for consumers? Where is their mindset at? So we are not looking at traditional social media. We're not looking at Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Instead, we're focused on things like forums, thinking of places like Reddit or Quora, where there's lots of rich information, lots of back and forth, comments on YouTube sites, comments on blog posts, comments on news articles, and anywhere and everywhere those two criteria are met. When we observe conversation, we look to understand what things mean to consumers, what are the associations that they're making, what are the associations to the associations, again, in order to understand not just what inflation means to consumers in the context of the holidays, but why it matters. So we'll get into this. All right, so all of our reports are structured in a very similar way. That is, we start with our empathy slide. Why are consumers engaged? What are their motivations, their attitudes, their values, their fears? Now, of course, I mentioned we look at a large number of consumers, usually over 100,000 unique consumers are included in our sample size. Um, and when we're looking at that many people, very clearly there is a spectrum of motivations. But we hone in on the lead or the most engaged consumer, the type of consumer or the type of mindset that is helping to set expectations for others. So these are the consumers that we might think of as cultural creators. So why do consumers care about inflation and the holidays beyond the obvious that it impacts what they can buy and their budget? Well, interestingly, these consumers are, they wanna prove that they have the power, they have the ability to negotiate within the system. That is, they believe that they can negotiate within the rules of the market system in order to get good deals. That is, they believe they can make smart, logical choices in order to create a better quality of life for themselves and their family. So by being smart, they're going to get more. They're going to get ahead in life, if you will. 
And it's not to say that they um, expect something for nothing. In fact, they value ambition. That is, they want to achieve greatness. They know that in order to do that, they need determination. They need to work hard. Um, so, you know, what are they doing about it? Well, they want to save some money. Not surprisingly, we're going to see throughout our conversation today that consumers are making some trade-offs. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but really, these are consumers you're going to see. They're looking for deals. They're looking for discounts. They're looking for coupons. They're looking for ways to get the best price possible to feel like they're smart, to feel like they're doing something good for themselves and their family. Now, lastly, what are their fears? What are their vulnerabilities? Well, when it comes down to it, they feel like, you know, their fear is that they're not going to get the recognition they deserve for their, their work, right? We mentioned they value ambition. Um, they're afraid that their hard work, their dedication is not going to be recognized. Um, they're not going to get rewarded because somebody else is going to surpass them. Somebody has more skill, more drive, more intellect or productivity. So we're getting a sense of who our most engaged consumers are, what's going on in their mindset. And we're going to see this come to, to come to life in the report itself. So the second thing at Motive Base is we have a slightly different metric or a slightly different way of measuring things than you may be used to. So I'm, I'm going to say this a few times. I just want to hammer it home. But we're, as I said, obsessed with the study of culture. So we're not actually measuring behavior or household penetration. Um, instead, when I show you this graphic, when I show you this visual, what we're looking at is how mature a culture is. And this is something that's been talked about by structural anthropologists for a long time now. And they had a theory, it's not a motivated theory, I'll admit it. They had a theory that the more consensus there is in the meanings that consumers associate with a topic, a trend, or an issue, the more mature it is in culture. Now we've harnessed the power of AI and natural language processing to find out, figure out a way how to calculate, is there consensus? Is there shared meaning in a culture? And what you can see here is that we are sitting in established ideas, indicating to us, yeah, most consumers, if we ask them, what does inflation and the holidays mean to you? They're gonna give us a very similar response. That is, there's a, a great deal of shared meaning when it comes to dealing with inflation and the holidays. The other thing to note is that this is relevant to 129.7 million Americans. That's out of consumers between the ages of 18 and 74. And one thing I didn't mention previously is that when we collect data, we do get a representative sample of consumers based on census data and, and stats. But of course, every culture, there's more engagement among some groups or other groups. And what we're seeing here is when we compare this culture to national averages, we're seeing there's more engagement or there's over-indexing among 35 to 54 year olds. So middle-aged consumers often who have children or who have a lot of responsibilities. We're also seeing some over-indexing among low, um, consumers with lower or technical levels of education, as well as lower income earners um, and consumers with children. So if we're thinking about who's most engaged in this culture, we're starting to get a, a picture of who those consumers are. All right, so now let's get into the nitty gritty details. We had five microcultures or five key trends that were relevant in the context of inflation and the holidays. So this is like a table of contents slide. This is just giving you a sense of what we're going to talk about today and we'll get into having a bit more conversation in a minute. But we saw five things. One, really interestingly, consumers are talking about how to balance time versus money. And they're trying to figure out how much is their time really worth in an inflationary environment. So we all know that expression, time is money. Well, consumers are trying to figure out, is that true? And they're trying to figure out where and when it makes sense to trade off their time or to spend a little bit more to get some time back. And, and we'll see delivery comes up a lot there. Second, we see consumers discussing embracing discount groceries. That is, they're turning away from name brands. They're looking for um, off brands or, or store brands um, to save some money. We also do see this impacts on their channel where they're shopping. They're looking increasingly to discount stores to save some money. Now, third is interesting. 
And you'll see there is a bit of a spectrum in many of these microcultures or among these trends. And we see many consumers are looking to stay closer to home this year. They're looking to avoid that international airfare or expensive hotels. And instead, consumers are embracing the home aspect of home for the holidays. That is, they're really trying to enjoy life at home or around their home in order to, you know, still enjoy the magic of the holidays, have fun and bond together. But, you know, inflation is having an impact on their vacation budgets and they're making tough decisions. Now, four and five are related to gift giving. And we see consumers are particularly interested this year in practical gift giving. Um, that is, they are looking for things that their friends and families will need. They're trying to be thoughtful in it and trying to lessen the blow of, on, of inflation on the people in their lives. Lastly, really interestingly, what we're seeing is consumers are starting to think about luxury in a new way. There's a shift taking place in the sense that increasingly they see luxury as something that's comfortable or wellness boosting. It makes them feel better and isn't necessarily just about the cost or a big ticket item. So now what we'll do is we'll dive into our findings in more detail and Steve is going to jump in with some comments. We'll talk a little bit about which, what each of these means for you, what, what it means for, for food producers, manufacturers, vendors, and so on. Okay, time versus money spent. Um, so again, what's really interesting here is consumers are reevaluating the time versus money equation in their lives. They're weighing when it's more cost efficient to pay for food delivery um, or when it's more cost efficient to shop in person to save money on some fees. And ultimately, it will depend on the circumstances or the context in which the consumer uh, finds themselves. Um, but we do see a lot of this debate is taking place when it comes to in-person shopping versus delivery, which sometimes has some fees attached to it. So here, what was also interesting to us is we saw consumers talking about childcare. Um, you know, people with kids, especially single parents, are noting it's not always easy to shop with kids. And so, you know, hiring a babysitter is expensive. Maybe getting delivery, you know, saves me on that babysitter. And therefore, it's more affordable to order my groceries directly from a store or a restaurant. So some consumers are also trying to avoid delivery apps that have further fees, looking for saving strategies there. Um, we also see consumers looking for ways to cut down on gas expenditures as they go from store to store. So those consumers who have decided that it's better to invest the time in their shopping and errands are trying to maximize their time though. They're trying to make sure that they're doing all of their errands in one session, trying to get the best route to the stores or minimize shopping at multiple stores. So we are seeing gas does come up here as a, a pressure point. Gas prices come up as a pressure point for consumers. Um, other consumers are noting, you know what, we can actually save some time and money through delivery. We just need to be smart about where we're ordering. And so we see some consumers talking about subscription grocery services like Hungry Root. Um, others are noting, you know, if you spend more than $35 or there's a certain ceiling at which you get free delivery, so it's a good idea to bundle or put all our groceries in together. Um, some consumers, really interestingly, we're also talking about other ways to save here. Um, some were talking about imperfect produce delivery. And I know we've seen this come up in other contexts where we looked at sustainability and consumers interested in those imperfect fruits as a way to avoid food waste. Well, here we're seeing consumers are thinking about them as a way to save some money. So again, what we see is this time money calculation going on for consumers. When we look at this on our maturity curve, it's relevant to 50.2 million consumers today. And you're going to see every one of our microcultures is sized a little differently in that context of inflation and the holidays. Um, this microculture is in the early consensus. Um, like our macro culture, I didn't mention this, but it is volatile. So typically we would make a prediction. Um, in this instance, the topics, the language that consumers are using is flip-flopping. We're not seeing a consistent pattern. And as such, this is volatile. Uh, but nonetheless, it is really interesting 
to see that consumers are talking about how to factor in time, how to save money, looking for quick meals, fuel costs comes up to them, uh, comes up in their own language, I should say. Um, they're talking about childcare, their holiday budget, how they're running errands, what's essential, where can I get a discount, looking for extra savings, talking about bulk, we're going to see this come up again in another microculture. Again, transport costs are coming up directly from consumers. Um, some of these consumers are noting they hate grocery shopping, therefore it's worth spending a little bit more for delivery. So again, context matters, but we are seeing that in the consumer's mind, they're doing this calculus between time and money. Um, so I'm curious, Steve, as yep. to, to what this means to you and, and what you think the implications of this are. Well, I, I use that calculus phrase a lot when it comes to consumers, all these weird calculations they're doing in their head to figure things out. But I think the volatility of this particular microculture, which was, was particularly interesting to us, I think people are really, you know, we've gone through this pandemic where people changed their shopping habits and people rushed to online shopping. And then we had out of stocks and, and all kinds of stuff going on. Now we have inflation going. So I think the volatility here is people really trying to figure out what works for them and doing that the calculus, as you said, to figure out, you know, their their dynamics, whether, you know, it's child care because they got to pay for child care or it's child care because they don't want to have to take the kids to the store and say no to them when they want to buy this, that and whatever. Um, so there's a lot of factors in there. But we definitely we just released our, our, our trends uh, tracker yesterday and we saw, saw a decrease and there's been a lot of reporting in September of decrease in online grocery sales. I think people are trying to figure out where they can make their money go the furthest. You know, is it avoiding those fees or do they need to buy more when they shop online? Um, I think some folks feel who we saw a lot of folks almost exclusively going to online uh, for a while there and now they're not doing it quite as exclusively because they're going into the store maybe looking to see maybe there's a better deal in the store maybe I'm missing out for something so uh, a lot of different things going on there in terms of you know that that calculus like you said figuring out what works for me what works for my dynamics um, a few other things I'll point out too um, that we're seeing uh, a couple of departments in the grocery stores are doing particularly well, food service and bakery. And I, you know, we wonder if food service may be because they don't want to eat out as much. Um, that's an option, you know, get the rotisserie chicken or the, the pizza and make that one night as opposed to ordering uh, from the pizza pizza shop or whatever. Um, you know, the bakery, so they don't have to make an extra trip to the bakery, things like that. Um, you know, combining some of those trips. So, and then of course we have, you know, just in general cooking at home during the pandemic, we, we all bought all those devices like air fryers and pressure cookers. We learned how to yep. cook and, and we're realizing maybe yeah, it could be cheaper just to cook at home. So a, a lot of things going on there. But I think again, going back to that volatile nature of this particular subculture is interesting because I think people are just continuing to figure out through all these things that they've experienced over the past few years, what works for me, what works for my family, um, you know, how do I navigate all of this? Absolutely. And it's so interesting that bakery sales are, are, are doing well, because I think that will link to something we're seeing as well, we haven't talked about yet, but this idea that comfort is increasingly yes. important to consumers, right? Even that idea that being at home is becoming or I mean, staying important to consumers. So, so yeah, that's absolutely that, interesting. That fresh baked bread or that fresh donut or whatever, yes, hot right. bake. <laughs> yeah, it feels, feels good on a cold morning, yes. Right, yeah, absolutely. And you know, you also mentioned some consumers are looking at a variety of strategies. We see they're going into stores, they're shopping online, looking at getting the best prices possible. And we also see here, some consumers are, are making a shift in terms of the brands that they're buying as well as where they're shopping. And so we see here, consumers are increasingly concerned that name brand uh, food products are, are a bit hard on their budgets. They hit harder. So they're looking for ways to save some money. Um, and consumers believe that since inflation is causing grocery prices to just go up and up, they should be more careful. And one of the ways they're doing that is by rethinking their brand name food purchases in favor of food from cheaper sources um, so that they can afford food throughout the holiday season so that they can still have that really amazing great holiday meal they still want to get together with their families we see 
consumers are looking for strategies to make the holidays as wonderful as, as they want them to be or as they expect them to be. Um, and here we absolutely see consumers turning to um, discount grocery stores. We see them talking about going to places like Aldi's, for example, where they feel like the prices are lower than some of those other supermarkets that are available to them. Um, they're also quite excited to learn that Aldi is going to launch a shoppable website because they do do some online comparison and, 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 you know, there is some interest in hybrid shopping where they look online, see where the deals are and organize their time accordingly. Um, others are interested in curbside pickup as we talked about doing that calculus. Um, we did see some consumers turning in particular to uh, store brand or non-name brand veggies and fruits. We see consumers turning to frozen fruits and vegetables as a strategy to save without putting you know, nutrition at stake. They feel that frozen is often just as good. It's frozen at peak times. Um, and it's a good way, particularly as the weather turns and you know, we don't have as much in season in parts of the U.S. and the North in particular. Um, you know, they're they're looking for ways to save. Some of these consumers are also talking about farmers markets or the small produce stands that have more affordable price points. Um, that said, not everybody is making this switch. Many consumers still love their name brand products, and so they're looking for ways to save on name brand products as well. They're looking for coupons, for example. Um, they're looking to learn how to be better at using coupons, using coupon websites like coupons.com or um, coupon apps as well. Ibotta came up here. Um, so again, they they love cash back options, ways to feel like their money is going further. And lastly, we do see consumers talking about partnering with friends or family members in order to um, buy things in bulk without going overboard. Or some consumers are, are noting that they're they're going with their friends to Costco. They're using their friends' Costco membership as a way to save some money. So again, we see consumers engaged in a wide variety of strategies in order to save money on their food budget as prices continue to rise. And they're looking for all these different ways to save. Um, Again, when it comes to consumers' language, you can see they're talking directly about shopping at Aldi, buying their grocery, their grocery budget is top of mind here. Frozen meals are coming up, fresh produce, food costs. The eggs, the price of eggs is particularly concerning to some of them. Um, interestingly, they are talking about using their credit card point. So again, the strategy goes beyond just couponing um, or using apps. Um, they are talking about the farmer's market. Again, buying in bulk comes up a lot throughout this report. Um, and you can see here that topic, friend with a Costco membership and clip coupons comes directly from consumers as well. This microculture is more mature. It is sitting in the mainstream today. It isn't volatile. We are seeing um, some predicted growth here. When we're looking at growth, what it's indicating to us is that there is increased shared meaning or consensus in what this means to consumers. Um, but again, if there's anything we can do to help consumers save, um, I think many consumers would, would welcome that. They welcome those coupons or, or deals. Um, so again, I, I'd love to hear, Steve, what you have to yeah. say if you saw this come up in your own survey. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah. So I mean, absolutely. This this particular microculture very much comes up in our survey. Um, kind of going back to pre-pandemic times, we always saw folks shopping around a lot. Um, typically, uh, shoppers shop an average of five banners in a typical month. So it's they, they were shopping around. Before the pandemic, it was because I want that cereal that they offer, or I want I like the bakery goods over there, or I like the meat at this place. Um, then when we came into the pandemic, it, there was a lot of out of stock. So I can't find toilet paper here. I got to go find toilet paper there. So they, they've been exploring a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of different, uh, different banners in terms of what they're doing. And now with inflation coming into play, um, they're looking for looking for those deals. I mean, they're looking for who's got a, you know, what on sale, who's got the special deal. Uh, private brands have done extremely well over the past year. Um, folks, you know, some of them may have been, they discovered it during the pandemic when the name brand was out of stock. So they tried and they're like, hey, this isn't so bad. Um, and so they, you know, they've kind of st stuck with it and they've kind of, 
have more of an openness in their mindset to try other things. We're not so set in our in our ways in terms of I've got to have X mustard or X ketchup or X mayonnaise or whatever, or like that's how interesting. They've, they've explored different things. So um, a lot of things going on there in terms of exploring. You brought up frozen and canned. Um, we're seeing folks moving from fresh fresh food to frozen in, in uh, canned foods. Um, that's, that's definitely there. Some of that may be from a food waste perspective. People are more sensitive to food waste right now because we you know we want to make sure we don't waste those dollars that we're spending at the store um we also saw in our survey people buying in bulk whether it's sharing with others or just buying in bulk uh, uh, that definitely comes in comes into play um other things like you know going uh, doing takeout whether it's from a grocery store again the food service or takeout from restaurants as opposed to sitting down at restaurants again trying to make that dollar go a little bit further during during these rough times and as, as uh, prices do do go up. So lots of things. Uh, one other thing I will point out also loyalty programs. The loyalty mm -hmm. program, you brought up the credit card points with the loyalty programs to source. A lot of folks taking advantage of them. Um, one for the gas points that some of them offer, certainly with gas prices that helps, but also because they that's where you do get the coupons, the deals, the you know, the, uh, you know, uh, BOGOs and things like that in terms yeah. of uh, those types of deals. So the loyalty programs are another thing that we're seeing folks in our survey um, uh, talking about and trying to take advantage of. So lots there. And there's a lot, the retailers need to think about this too. The, they, uh, as they talk to the consumers, you know, how can you be communicating to them to let them know? I mean, we, we see um, in, a, in an earlier survey we did that folks do feel that the retailers are on their side trying to help as much as they can, but, you know, showing that empathy to the, to the shopper um, in terms of, uh, you know, we're doing what we can, we're offering you these deals, you can use your loyalty program, et cetera. So a lot, lots of options there. Um, but uh, yeah, but people definitely shopping around uh, lots of ways. Absolutely. Now we're going to shift focus just a little bit with our third finding, which is around holiday travel. And, you know, given the fact that consumers are, are, are facing increased food prices, they're looking for ways to, to tighten up in, in other areas. And what we see here is consumers, again, of course, there are some consumers who will still travel internationally and will still have that vacation. But we're seeing, you know, a, a dominant approach among consumers is this idea of embracing the home when we talk about being home from the holidays um, to really soften the blow of, of inflation. So consumers still want to relax. They want their downtime. They, they want to enjoy the holidays. They want to take in the sights, the sounds, the light. Um, but, you know, they're reconsidering how much of their budget should be going to vacation. Airfare is very expensive right now. Hotels are very expensive right now. So consumers are, you know, thinking about is it the time to take a long distance trip or should we celebrate the season by really turning our homes and exploring our region um, into some kind of cozy refuge, right? So when we see this again and again in the work that we've been doing, consumers want a refuge. They want, you know, the indulgence, the baked goods that help them feel better about, you know, the, the tough times that we're in, the inflation stressed world that we're in. And so we did see consumers talking about having a staycation. This came up, it was quite dominant as we looked at consumer conversations. They're staying home. Um, that said, they're still looking to enjoy their holidays with their friends and family. Um, for example, they're talking about enjoying their weekends, turning their weekends and a few days off into really festive occasions. They still want their kids to have those great holiday memories. Um, so they're talking about decorating their homes, having their friends over to play games. So again, the home is, is kind of central here. Um, cooking and baking at home is also popping. Um, it's a great activity with the kids. Um, you know, again, they're looking to save some money from, you know, not traveling, but still enjoy holiday meals, still enjoy holiday activities together. Uh, many consumers, as I mentioned, are prioritizing those weekend getaways rather than going on a, a week long international vacation. We saw consumers talking about doing things that are close to home, things like hiking, checking out uh, the scenic locale in a, stair, in a nearby state park, for example. Um, and again, they're thinking that if I'm not spending money on long distance travel, I'll have more room in my budget to buy gifts, to go shopping, to have that big meal, um, to maybe splurge on a little gift here or there. 
We also see them talking about enjoying local interactions, as I mentioned. Um, leading up to Thanksgiving, they're very excited about things like apple orchards, pumpkin festivals, hay rides, enjoying all that fall has to offer to get them in that festive spirit in time for Thanksgiving. Then when it comes to Christmas, they're talking about enjoying the light displays, going to pop-up holiday markets, checking out what local artisans are offering, um, and enjoying special holiday events at restaurants or craft breweries, wineries. So we still see food is playing a big role here as our drinks. Um, again, food offers a lot of creature comfort. It provides opportunities to bond. Um, I know Steve mentioned this idea of staying home, getting takeout at home, maybe a more affordable solution, or even getting food service from the grocery store. And we see this here as well. Um, many consumers are talking about, you know, putting off the date night, not having the babysitter, and instead having date night at home. Um, they're reading about baking again, um, baking and then enjoying the fruits of your labor with a Christmas movie, um, ordering date night subscription boxes, or, you know, holding at home holiday potlucks. So again, potlucks are a nice way everyone contributes, you still have the food, you still have those bonding moments, but it takes the pressure off the host to a certain extent. Um, and then finally, I did mention some consumers, of course, are still planning to travel. Um, however, we did see that they were talking about budgeting, how they're going to make that happen. They're going to do some budgeting. They may be thinking about cutting out what they describe as frivolous purchases along the way. Um, they're looking for deals on hotel rooms. They're booking their trips earlier in an effort to get some discounts. Um, we also saw some consumers talk about avoiding unnecessary purchases, maybe you know, turning that Starbucks habit from a daily habit into a weekly habit or cooking at home more instead of getting so much takeout. Um, similarly, some consumers are thinking, maybe I don't need this streaming service. I don't need to have five streaming services or what have you. So we absolutely see consumers are looking for ways to save. Um, again, though this is predominantly about travel, it clearly has some implications when it comes to food and drinks. When it comes to how consumers are talking, I mentioned they are using the language of the staycation. Kids' activities are very important. Time at home was coming up. Even the social plans, some of them revolving around the home. The holiday budget has come up, I think, in almost every single microculture. Uh, shopping trip, meals at home. Uh, a weekend getaway versus that overseas holiday, local attractions were coming up. Um, similarly, gas is still coming up here. So it is still a consideration as they're doing those local getaways. Staying close helps to save some gas money. Um, we also see buying Starbucks comes right from consumers, as does hotel rates and that notion of frivolous spending. Um, this is also in the mainstream, relevant to 74.1 million consumers today. Um, again, implications for food and beverages, consumers are still going to want to eat. They still want those seasonal drinks, seasonal food items as part of the overall experience. So Steve, I'm also wondering if, if this came up for you or if you've seen something similar um, or what you think this means. Yeah, I, I think the one thing that I focus on here is the cozy part of it. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you know, over the past couple of years, um, we've all dealt with uh, a lot of emotional strain through this pandemic, and everything else, that, that feeling of coziness, that uh, the emotional well-being of everyone, um, you know, we see in our surveys, you know, people focus on health and well-being and that, mm -hmm. that aspect of things I think is, is really important. And I think, you know, food brings out a lot of emotions for folks, a lot of warm, warm, cozy emotions. So um, definitely comes to play there in the fact that, you know, family cooking together, baking together, um, experiencing that together, um, you know, whether it's, you know, and then, you know, obviously you know, watching a movie or playing games together, all, all those types of things. Um, but uh, I, I think, you know, we, as I said earlier, we've learned a lot of new tricks in terms of cooking. We've learned we actually, so a lot of us can cook, maybe not all of us, but uh um, but uh, there's lots of easy ways to do that, and um, it's it's a great way just to kind of connect with everybody, um, you know, sitting around having having a good meal, um, and you know, definitely can make it festive. I think our retailers can do a lot um, in terms of. Uh, giving folks ideas of uh, things that they can do together. Some of the things can be very simple. Um, everything doesn't need to be from scratch cooked meal. Um, there's mm -hmm. 
things that you, you can make that still, you know, bring out the warmth or, you, you know, again, going back to the food service, you know, you can start with a rotisserie chicken and do lots of lots of fun stuff with that. Um, so th there's lots of things here to get that cozy the feeling um, and to be sensitive to folks uh, expenses. So I think the retailers and the food industry could do a lot in terms of, uh, you know, focusing in on those emotions that people are looking for. Um, and then, you know, just also keeping in mind one of the dimensions there is people want to be um, thinking about the the word cheap always makes me it gives me a negative connotation but it, you know at least be sensitive to to maybe being thrifty or whatever um you know we have we have this thing we uh work with the hartman group on our trends reports and you know they talk about the theatrics of thrift and people wanting to feel like they're being smart with their money and knowing that a lot of people are suffering out there so tapping into that idea that uh you know at least be thinking about being thrifty and being sensitive to what's happening um, in the world out there. But again, I'll, I go back to that word cozy as in terms of this microculture. I think that that emotional aspect of things that people are really thriving for. And I think, you know, this, this election season doesn't help with that in many ways, but uh, you, know, you don't have that up there in Canada, I know, Cheryl, but uh, um, but I'm sure you've, you've heard, you know, all the fun with the election. So people are, you know, want to want to feel good emotionally. So I Absolutely. think you definitely tap into that. Absolutely. And I, I love that. I think that's absolutely right. That that desire to feel cozy, feel comfortable, insulate ourselves from some of the stuff that's going on in the world around us to have a good holiday. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that brings us to gift giving. So, you know, big parts of the holiday are, are shared food experiences, shared activities. And then, of course, gift giving does matter to consumers and what we're seeing here is consumers are thinking about practical gifts that are thoughtful they still want to show they care for the people in their lives but they also want to make sure their friends and their family members have what they need um, amid rising inflation and rising prices um, and so consumers believe that they can gift frugally while still showing that they care still showing that they've put thoughts into the gift by giving presents that are really focused on the recipient's practical needs. And so we see this kind of shifting away from really flashy gifts, and we'll see this in our next microculture as well. Um, so ultimately, consumers are, are turning to gifts that make sure their friends' and family's needs are being met. Um, some of these consumers, it's really interesting, are, again, talking about how they're budgeting. And they're talking about starting a Christmas fund in the fall or even earlier, potentially in the summer, um, so that they can tap into this money while buying gifts. They can budget very strategically. As you mentioned, strategy matters here. They're thinking strategically. They want to show that they're smart. Um, they're also budgeting as a way to avoid impulse purchases. So they want to stick to that budget that they've set out for themselves. Um, but they are talking about ways to save money leading up to the holiday so that they have some extra extra funds on hand for the Christmas season, including things like a Christmas club bank account. Um, there are bank accounts that are, are tagged for holiday spending. Um, they're also learning, we talked about this in another section, how to use cash back, gift cards, loyalty programs as a way to get more, as a way to, to give gifts, to give really nice gifts. Um, we use the word cheap here. We also tend to avoid it. They want more affordable, but still stylish secondhand and vintage was coming up here. We've seen this in a number of other reports that we've done where consumers are considering vintage. Vintage is trendy as well for clothing right now, but it's often also more affordable. Um, this is also true when it comes to toys. Buying secondhand toys is a way to get something that your kid really wants. They've been asking for, but keeping in the budget. Um, that said, we do see consumers are turning to functional gifts this year. Um, they think that they could be helpful for a recipient on a budget. So also aware that other people in their lives are doing with, with um, rising prices. Um, so we see consumers, some of them talking about buying things like school supplies or books, things that feel very practical. Um, you know, they're also talking about shopping at places like Target and Walmart. Um, because they offer holiday deals early. There's constant deals. And if they're smart, again, if they pay attention to the flyers or the websites or the apps, they can buy something with some planning ahead um, that is really going to make their friend or family member happy. Um, we do see as well other strategies around toys beyond secondhand is um, 
toy sharing with friends. So again, it's interesting to see there's a communal aspect to this in terms of consumer strategies. We saw that kind of sharing or, or borrowing their friends' uh, memberships or going along with their friends to membership stores. Um, and here we saw consumers, you know, trading toys, the toys that their kids have outgrown or no longer play with to somebody else who can gift them to their kids. And so from the kids' perspective, it feels like they have something new, even if it is secondhand. Of course, again, this is a spectrum of consumers. We do see some consumers who want to splurge, who have the ability to splurge, but we're still seeing they're interested in practical gifts. They're looking to buy a higher end version of a practical gift that they're uh, recipient will get a lot of use out of. So we're seeing things like a really nice shaving kit come up, um, you know, or an electric toothbrush. It may not be the most exciting gift ever, but at the same time, they're putting thought in, paying attention to their budget and looking for something that will be useful in the recipient's life. Um, so again, we see kids' gifts are very important here. We see consumers talking about having a frugal month, so thinking about saving some money earlier in the year in order to have some extra cash for Christmas gifts and Christmas food. Um, clothes comes up. They're talking about the prices of everything, not just food here. Costco is coming up. Walmart's coming up. School clothes are even coming up from the consumers. Um, going to Target was coming up. That concern about impulse purchases there. Christmas fund is there as well. And so again, um, this was an interesting one, a little bit of a shift from what we've seen in previous years. Um, it is a little bit earlier on. It's just right in that mainstream, but this is predicted to grow by almost 30%. So we're looking um, again at maturity and culture, but we're expecting more and more shared meaning or consensus around this desire for something practical and being smart with our budget, finding ways to save, finding ways to make sure our, our money goes further. Um, Steve, I'm wondering what you're seeing when it comes to gift giving. Yeah, I mean, I think I, in terms of what could be more practical than food, I mean, right? food, practical as it gets. So definitely um, that's something to, to tap into. We, as they say, we all have to eat. So uh, food yeah. is definitely is, is something that comes into play there. Um, but there's also, again, the, the food has a lot of emotional meaning to people. Um, you, you know, you have different ethnic types of foods. You have different... Um, you know, family histories with food, that a lot of things you can tap into there that are both very practical, but also um, show thought and meaning in terms of uh, gift giving. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the, the retailers, uh, again, we can focus on this in terms of understanding um, where people's mindset is right now in terms of uh, what, what types of gifts they want to give, what they want to want to share with people. Um, there's also, you know, a variety of things in terms of, uh, you know, self-care types of gifts, uh, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, ideas of like maybe, you know, instead of going out to dinner uh, with folks or taking people out to dinner, making them a nice dinner um, shows mm -hmm. a lot of thought and, and, and thinking there. Um, I We see a lot of folks in terms of holiday gatherings looking to do things like um, whether it's potluck or having people bring things along in terms of saving money you know, there. So you can, you know, instead of maybe a bottle of wine, maybe it's a side dish is, that you bring as a gift, or, you know, those types of things. Um, and then when we, we talk to folks uh, in our survey about what their plans are for the holidays, and we're seeing a lot of people actually for New Year's Day, New Year's looking to stay at home this year, um, mm -hmm. not go out and spend, you know, the huge money on New Year's. Maybe they go out another night where it's less expensive and enjoy New Year's at home. So a lot of, uh, you know, practical thinking in terms of uh, consumers in terms of these areas and, and how they're going to celebrate the holidays and how they're going to share gifts with folks. Yeah, and that brings us to our last section for today, which this is idea again, you know, what we're seeing is, is consumers are rethinking luxury. And I think that goes back to a couple of things that you said, Steve, this idea of wellness being increasingly important to consumers, health and well-being being increasingly important to consumers. And what we're seeing here is consumers are rethinking what luxury means. And there's a shift to seeing a luxury is something that's comfortable, that boosts positive feelings or boosts wellness, rather than necessarily a big ticket or a flashy item. And so this is really interesting to me, this idea of prioritizing the emotional feelings of luxury. So I know, Steve, you, you pointed out how emotions mattered when it came to cozy. And what's interesting here is we're also seeing emotional connection to luxury um, being defined as comfort and wellness. 
rather than gauging luxury by just a big price tag on an electronic appliance or jewelry. And so really what we're seeing here is consumers are redefining luxury as comfort, relaxation, and wellness, rather than this big class of expensive goods. Now, again, there's a spectrum of consumers and there'll still be people who want those, those flashy gifts or more expensive gifts. But nonetheless, we're seeing consumers talk about finding holiday joy in homemade meals. They're a fraction of the price, um, especially when it comes to going out to a really fancy restaurant. Um, but at the same time, it helps to bring about this feeling of comfort. It helps to bring about this feeling of, of wellness or wholesomeness. Um, we see consumers talking about having a holiday pizza night. They're buying dough, cheese, and sauce, but then they're looking for um, you know, interesting toppings, maybe being uh, a bit creative with the toppings. Um, we also see, not surprisingly, uh, gourmet coffee comes up in this context. It brings a warm, more luxurious coffee shop taste into their homes. Um, it's more affordable, of course. Um, so you get a, a, the experience of something that tastes delicious, but it's a little bit more affordable. Um, this is also true of coffee, uh, sorry, chocolate, right? Thinking about premium chocolate um, as, an, as a way to feel good, feel comfortable, feel cozy. Um, some consumers are going to go to restaurants, of course. It's a nice splurge. It's a fun experience. Um, and they talk about doing it or timing it so that it doesn't affect their budget. So, you know, timing a, a nice restaurant after payday and then budgeting accordingly. Um, we also see com some consumers are thinking about gifting in a way that, that dovetails with recipients' hobbies. Again, there's a bit of a practicality aspect to that, giving somebody something that, that is part of their hobby. Um, but it's also here we see consumers want to provide the experience of comfort, joy, and wellness to the other people in their lives. Um, and so they're talking about gifting cooks and foodies, small kitchen goods. Um, we'll, you know, see consumers talk about giving gardeners uh, green thumb gadgets, herb drying racks, and these kinds of things. Now, again, some consumers are not as stretched. Um, some of our middle class consumers in this context, they want the little luxuries. Um, they're talking about things like uh, a cashmere sweater. Again, cozy, comfy is coming to mind here. Or a portable fireplace candle, which again brings back that notion of cozy and comfort. Um, Self-care as well would be relevant here. Um, again, this isn't the mainstream, relevant to a lot of folks, 76.1 million consumers. We can see they're talking about these as little luxuries, the affordable luxuries, if you will. Um, they're looking to save money. Again, food is part of this. Hobbies, as I said, are part of this. We see coffee coming up. We see, I mean, this is relevant to chocolate. Other kind of luxury food items that don't break the bank are very relevant here. Um, and then again, we can see that trade-off between should we create a really nice kind of gourmet inspired meal at home or should we go out? So again, we see consumers making that calculus going on here. And again, I'm curious, Steve, what do you make of this? Does this resonate to you? Yeah, no, I think, you know, some of this is, again, kind of tapping into the emotions of people, making people, you know, have that warm, co cozy feeling, you know, we keep going back to there's this kind of, this all kind of integrates yeah. together very nicely, but there's a lot of things that, that food definitely applies that you brought up the coffee, the chocolate, um, whether it's, you know, a, a specialty pizza or any, some type of special meal or special type of uh, main course that you wouldn't normally cook uh, during the rest of the year or might take a little extra effort. Um, there's a lot, a lot of things, uh, you know, again, you know, tapping into family histories, you know, what grandma used to make, um, you know, ethnic connections, people's hobbies. I mean, there's just lots of ways here to, you know, the folks can kind of take time and think about who they're gifting and give them something that really will tap into those emotions without breaking the bank for them in terms of uh, what we're all dealing with right now. So, you know, it's, it's a little, those little luxuries, those little things, the, the thought that goes into it can go very far um, in terms of uh, how people react to some of these ideas, so. Great. So I have one more slide to show everybody, and then we'll, I, I think there are some questions. Last slide is we've plotted each of our microcultures using our population size along here and our maturity score along here. 
just as a way to help us think about how we might want to prioritize these. Luxury as comfort is predicted to be relevant to the most people, most mature, followed by those discount groceries, um, those affordable luxury, sorry, those affordable getaways, um, practical gift giving. And then of course we see the volatility around by balancing time and money. Um, we often suggest kind of going, working from top to bottom, but of course, if there's something that's very relevant to you, to your business, then, you know, start start where it, where it makes the most sense for you. You know, if practical gift giving makes the most sense to you, then obviously start there. But it's just nice to see these in relation to one another to get a sense of what's really meaningful to consumers. So on that note, um, it would be great to hear if we had some questions from the audience, if anyone has any questions or comments, responses. We have had a couple of questions, uh, Cheryl. The first is around um, consumer spending. And I think you touched on this, but if we could hear a bit more about the trade-off and the shift from things to experiences. And I think that ties in a bit to the coziness, but it mm -hmm. sounds like the coziness is happening in home. Any thoughts either of you have on that shift from the physical to the experiential? in gift giving. Yeah, I mean this is this is a trend we were we were seeing and we were being asked about for the last few years and in the last couple of years it was very clear that there was a shift between things and experiences. And this year I'm not so sure that there's a full on shift taking place. As we've seen here, things still matter to people as Steve said, everybody's got to eat. Um and so I think there's a little bit of um in this year's context, in the inflationary context, I think things still matter to consumers. The said experiences are coming up here. We see vacations are coming up, having a staycation, being close to home. Um, so this is a trend I would continue to monitor, this ongoing shift from, from things to experiences. But I think in the inflationary context, things become a little bit more important. But nonetheless, I think regardless of if it's a thing or an experience, those emotions, connecting back to those emotions are important, right? The desire right. for something cozy, comfortable, something that feels like we're doing good things for ourselves. I think that's what I would tap into regardless of if we're promoting a thing or an experience. Yeah, I was just going to say the emotions definitely is part of it. And then going back to the very beginning of your presentation, Cheryl, just people feeling like they're getting kind of getting their due in terms of what their investment is that they're you know, yeah. you know maybe be the best deal but getting a good deal make you know making sure that they're feeling like they're not going to suffer financially that they can make their money work effectively that's an emotion as a gift giver along with the gift receiving aspect of things yeah and then I think that's another good point is that what we're seeing here as well is consumers are, are trying to do their absolute best to ensure that the recipient is going to see the thought that went into it and the care mm -hmm. that went into it, regardless of if they're gifting a thing or an experience. Right. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of retailers, you know, the food industry, we can do a lot in terms of giving people ideas for some of these things to yeah. give suggestions. You know, we're really good at like giving recipes and things like that, I think in the store and whatever, but there's a lot that we can do in terms of, you know, giving suggestions to folks to help them uh, navigate these times. Absolutely. That's a great question. Great, thank you. And one other question that's come through that's a that's a little bit off of the inflation topic, but still relevant and important is any data or 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 signals that you're seeing from consumers that cooking cooking at home uh, is better due to the health reasons than than eating out or getting takeout. Um, I I think this is probably something that that came up during during the pandemic when we were all yeah. locked at yeah. home. Um, I mean, we're, but, we're, we definitely saw during the pandemic folks focusing on health and well-being and eating healthy and trying to be smarter with their eating. And we're still seeing that carry through now. Okay, um, good. You know, the concern about the pandemic is not quite as high as it was. It's still there. Um, and then I think we've heard some news, at least I had in the last couple of days, that this winter may not be so great. So I think the health and well-being aspect of things right. um, is uh, something that people are very sensitive to right now and, and you know, are um, looking to be smart for themselves and their families in that regard. 
Yeah, and, and we see this too time and time again. We see consumers, you know, one of the benefits when it comes to health and nutrition of cooking at home is being in control of the ingredients, having full control over what goes into the food and therefore what right. goes into our bodies. Um, we see, again, thinking of the emotional side of that, we see consumers want to have some control. Um, but we also see, um, to Steve's point, we see this growing concern about physical health, their holistic approach to health. How can we fortify our mental health, our immune health? We've mm -hmm. seen um, a growing trend around functional foods, food as yeah. medicine, turning to food as a way to protect our health, but also um, prevent some, some illnesses or prevent some issues from, from coming to light in the first place. So absolutely, those are trends that we're seeing. Yeah. Definitely. Great. Well, I, those are all the questions we have. I think this, I'm feeling very cozy and comfortable with my cold here. So all of this is relevant to me today. Can um, I, can I, Mickey, can I just put in one shameless plug here? If folks want to see any of our trends research, just go to fmi.org. There's a, on the, on the homepage there on fmi.org, you can click through and see all of the trends research. Uh, we had six reports this year. Um, we've done stuff with you guys. Um, we've all, the, um, plant-based food survey uh, report. We have uh, food as medicine we've done with you guys that there's, we have uh, information on those things that uh, Cheryl just brought up. So lots of good information there. So fmi.org, very simple. Yes, Sorry. My shameless no, no, plug no. For today. <laughs> no, I mean, we really value this partnership and I think it, it hopefully it brings to the food system some more insights on, on where to focus uh, and how to enter the holidays with, with, a, with, a, with a strength um, yes. moving forward. So um, again, thank you both for your time and your expertise. Sure. Um, this was this was fun and interesting. And uh, again, for um, for members and non members of, of CFI, we we do these on a fairly almost monthly basis. So um, appreciate your attending this month. And uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks again, Steve and Cheryl. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.